thank you. Let me just get into it. I have a lot of slides, so I'll go fast through the ones that are less important and slow through the ones that are more important. At the beginning, we considered a model where we had nuclei interacting with the lattice, something like this. And under normal conditions, nothing interesting happens. The interactions with the nuclei are weak. Cytostates decay quickly. Destructive interference destroys second order processes. And um, the only way to proceed was we needed reasonably stable nuclear states. We need uniform interactions. And we need off resonant loss to get rid of the uh, destructive interference effects. Um, nuclear molecules have been known <coughs> for ages. Um, I've put together some codes to calculate them using finite range liquid drop model. And for palladium, you can get um, nuclear molecules that look something like that. Unfortunately, the, um, the fission type of calculation, absolutely none of these nuclear molecules have any stability at all in the uh, master <coughs> gene near palladium. Uh, as I was banging my head against the wall, I read some papers and noticed that in the case of carbon-12, carbon-12, that uh, calculation was not a finite range liquid drop model was done. And I gave a minimum, which corresponded to the two uh, carbon nuclei acting as clusters, basically touching. So the minimum energy is when they're sort of touching uh, flat together. Um, also found some uh, similar papers for O16, O16, and also for heavier nuclei as well. And I thought to myself, this is the ticket. So I basically motivated by that, put together a really simple sort of general model for binary nuclear molecules, ground state daughter, ground state daughter, um, liquid drop models, spherical, made them half a fermi apart. I can calculate the excitation energy, I can calculate the tunneling rate, and I can do it. I have a database of nuclear masses, so I can do it for all daughters, and here they are. <laughs> um, so this includes, so the, the energies are high, um, 40 MeV and higher. The um, tunneling rates range all over the place. Um, uh, years and nanoseconds on this side. These guys are up here. Um, the nuclei themselves are beta unstable. Um, the density of states of binary nuclear molecules looks something like this. Now this model uh, overestimates the excitation energy, so this could shift down by 5 MeV with no problem. And it also overestimates the decay rate, so things are actually more stable than the plot. Okay, so what we see is there's actually quite a few binary ground state nuclear clusters. If we added excited states, longer lived ones, then there'd be many more. If we added ro low rotational states and even vibrational states even more, um, there's three cluster configurations, there's four cluster configurations. But all of this is suggesting that there's a real possibility of having an enormous number of, of nuclear molecule states. So the idea is, over here we've got the D2 to helium 4 transition near 24 MeV, and over here we've got a zillion um, reasonably stable nuclear molecule states. So we could get the excitation from here, somehow up to here. Then we would have a serious chance of communicating the energy to the lattice or to um, plasmids. You think a little bit about the neural reaction. Uh, I proposed it in the late 1990s. Um, the basic idea is that a D2 makes a transition to helium-4, and a helium-4 makes a transition up to be D2. I call it the null reaction because it basically doesn't look like anything happens. Um, but there's a version of it which is actually interesting. If I start on this side with a molecule and go to the ground state helium, then on this side, if I start from ground state helium, if um, under, uh, under conditions where the deuterons are formed from the uh, helium and they have trouble tunneling apart, then you get a compact state. I think that this is connected to Kasagi's three-body experiments and Hubler's three-body experiments. I think this is also very closely related to uh, Chersky's uh, resonant uh, state, but more discussion. 
Um, so now the question is, can we model it? And um, so first thing we got to do is deal with the, getting rid of the destructive interference. If we're trying to go from here over to here, then the downward and the upward contributions, they, they cancel out and you get a very small number. Uh, these guys have extra energy and there's going to be loss processes that can be fast. So you get a, there's a factor two missing, but you get a loss down here so you can break the destructive interference. And the limit that the destructive interference is really fast, then you actually get a gigantic orders and orders of magnitude increase in the uh, uh, excitation transfer rate. So this gives me a scheme now. So this is specific to palladium deuteride. Start with D2 going to helium-4, make a transition to the compact state, uh, and I'll talk about a model for it. I've modeled this. And then it goes up. The idea is that two compact states go down, and one palladium ground state goes up to where the high density of states uh, live. And I've, I've simulated this with the models as well. And uh, when it goes up, um, actually when, when the D2 goes to make compact states, all of them go at once, as I'll describe shortly. And when it goes up, everybody that can go up, goes up <coughs> very quickly in a burst. When the system gets ready to go, it just, it just goes. And once I have the nuclear molecule states, then I can convert if the density of states is large enough such that um, the number of quanta can be uh, contributed is, is consistent with the physical system. Then you can go and transfer the nuclear energy to the lattice until it reaches a gap where it can't transfer the energy. So then it stops and scratches its head and decides what it's to do. And um, the idea is that more D2 can accumulate, make it to compact states. Now you can have the kid's sister of the up conversion we had before. So one compact state goes down and one nuclear molecule goes up. So you get a boost to 24 MeV. And now it starts going down and it can rinse and repeat. It just can cycle again, again, again. And when I saw uh, Kasaki's oscillations, I was thinking, aha, maybe, maybe we've got uh, some evidence for the, the cycling going on. Okay, so the dipole transition, I've been, um, uh, Conrad pointed out that the um, D2 to helium-4 um, transition is, is E2. Uh, there's also some E1 component from the triple P1 state. And since the quadruple coupling with the lattice is very, very low, I focused on the E1 transition. So I have a model which has acoustic phonons, optical phonons, plasmons, nuclear energy, and then um, electric dipole transitions, which are nuclear transitions due to the electric field of the phonons and plasmons. So first thing I have to do is include the, um, get the destructive interference. So now I can get a Hamiltonian that's free of the destructive interference. Next is I've got to relate the electric field to the vibrational and plasmonic degrees of freedom. And I can do it this way, um, which means in the case of uh, uh, phonons, um, I can get an uh, electric field operator, which would be a z squared down here. So this means that I can, I can actually now do calculations. I can calculate my transition matrix element sort of free of the destructive interference. It like, looks like this. It's complicated. Actually, I view this as sort of the simplest possible mechanism for these kinds of things. So these can be calculated and evaluated. So I can evaluate the electric field matrix element. But it's in terms of things which are not intuitively obvious. So I want to express things in terms of the dissipated power. So there you have phonons vibrating. The phonons have loss. And the, the amount of power being lost is far more relevant than either the number of phonons or the strength of the electric field. So I can write this coupling matrix element in terms of the dissipated power. And this gives me a model. So I can now put together a model and simulate um, the coupling between the uh, um, D2 to helium-4 fusion transition and the compact states. There's an E to the minus G that got dropped here. So now I have a Hamiltonian. 
I could do Erenfest equation and get a classical equivalent model for it. It turns out I can solve it exactly. <laughs> what happens is the, uh, de the fusion transition basically all at once dumps all of its, uh, it, it basically, every helium-4 that's available, it fills up and moves up to the compact state. And that comes back down. <laughs> and so um, we have an exact solution, which means I have a pulse length, so I know how wide this is. And then I can plug in some numbers to see um, how fast this can happen. And the pulse length here, uh, again, there's an e to minus gamma missing over here, but this one's got it. If I plug in numbers, uh, I get something like this. And if I use screening energies, basically I screen the Coulomb interaction, but I leave it the molecular potential for D2. And um, I get a prefactor, which is, is significant. Now I notice while preparing for these slides, these, these numbers are off, they're, they're a little bit too high. But the bottom line is out of the box, it looks like this model. Uh, basically can describe the, the first step and be consistent with experiment. So this is very exciting. Uh, one issue is that the scaling as a function of frequency is square root, so it means terahertz <coughs> works better than megahertz. But on the other hand, it's much easier to try something really hard transiently with megahertz and uh, have it be uniform over the material. Um, these states, contact states are not stable, but the quantum Zeno effect basically if it makes a transition before it can decay, that can stabilize these things. Okay, I want to talk now about excess heat production. So the uh, idea is that we have lots and lots of nuclear molecule states and they're separated by, I don't know, tens of ki 10 kilovolts or something like that. And so I'm making up an idealized model uh, where we um, assume that they're sort of all the same. So we have a Hamiltonian, we've got phonons, plasmons, we've got nuclear energies, and then we've got um, uh, transitions, dipole transitions. Now, for the energy exchange, you basically <coughs> figure it out, you have to solve this thing in a strong coupling limit. Uh, I, Irfan and I wrote a paper, actually we wrote lots of papers years ago, and um, if it were, a single quantum exchange or two quantum exchange, we, we would know the answer, we'd know how it works. So this is the hindrance factor associated with transferring lots of energy. Here's what it would be if we had two quantum exchange, uh, just modifying the earlier function. Uh, basically, if the coupling is weak, so the, the G factor is the dipole strength integrated over all transitions divided by the transition energy. And so when the coupling strength is weak, nothing happens whatsoever. You gotta goose it. And when you goose it hard, then it can kick on. And when it kicks on, then you can get a, a reasonable coupling. Let me, um, it's convenient to write it this way, to take all that complicated factor, make it two over delta n times an F2 function. And I say, what the heck is this? This looks like numerology. Well, the two over delta n actually corresponds to a physical limit where in the strong coupling, the system looks like it's got a state sort of every two delta e, two h bar omega or whatever, which in the strong coupling limit you can range. So uh, in the strong coupling limit, F2 can be on the order of one or five or 10 or something like that. Um, so we can now model it. We assume they're all the same, we model coherent transitions uh, among them. Uh, so this is an idealized um, uh, pseudo-spin formulation. So we have Ehrenfest dynamical equations. This time, I, I think an analytic solution is possible, but I was lazy and wrote a computer code. And, and basically, these things, they, they go very fast. The transitions, they, they move. And here's, if I do a scan over pseudo-spin number, where you are on the chain, it, it looks like this. It's, this is the Z component and the X and the Y component. It's pretty complicated. It turns out, this, it's, I think it's possible to model this thing analytically. Anyway, the speed of the pulse uh, from the numerical calculations ends up being this. 
So it's it's straightforward to evaluate, and uh, if the if the number of excited nuclear molecules is much less than the number of ground state, we give you up 10 to the 12th versus 10 to the 22nd or something. Then the speed's completely independent of how many nuclear molecules you have. So then we can calculate the excess power uh, from knowing the speed, and um, we'd like to know how fast it goes. So, in order to do that, we need to know the nuclear dipole matrix element for starting from ground state palladium and making a nuclear molecule. Well, that's not in the literature. I don't know how big it is. Nobody knows how big it is. Uh, on the other hand, I can calculate the static uh, dipole moment, which is going to be basically this. Um, and so I, gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, let me take the static dipole, which all, is all of this, and let me say there's going to be an unknown factor, because O oh, is everything I don't know. So maybe it's 10 to the minus 5, maybe it's 10 to the minus 4, who knows what it is. But maybe we can fit to experimental data and figure out what it is. So here's the strength of dipole moment, I'm assuming. So now I plug it in, and transfer in terms of the dissipated power, and I get an expression. So for phonons, it looks like this. Now let me slow down and put some time in on this. So this is dissipated power in watts. Okay, so this can be near one. The frequency in terms of 10 terahertz. So the optical phonon modes, which uh, lets two laser experiment identified somewhere near 10 terahertz. Um, the nuclear molecules, suppose I say they're near 50 MeV. Um, the number of ground state nuclei to the number of palladium, so it could be 10% or 20% or something. Then the number of nuclear molecules is, is compared to 2 times 10 to the 15th. So this will be a number probably less than 1, I don't know, 0.01, something like that. So then the excess power in terms of watts is this. So I know F2 can be 1 and maybe even 10, but now if O squared happens to be, I don't know, 0.1, which is enormous, if that happens to be true, then this would give numbers relative to experiment. Down here, it, it's actually better. These numbers are about 12 times bigger for coupling to plasmons. In fact, the, it's pretty clear the system wants to couple its energy with plasmons, so that someone's going to go into the phonons <coughs> as well. So we end up with a, a quantitative formula where the O squared F2 is something we can match to experiment. So this is, this is going to be roughly a constant for a system that's really running extremely well and uh, is in the strong coupling regime. So plasmons win. We need strong excitation terahertz phonons or plasmons. Even if we excite the terahertz phonons, it will put some of the energy in the plasmons anyway. We need lots of nuclear molecules. Um, probably, if, if the nuclei, if palladium nuclei spend some significant fraction of their time as clusters already, then you have the possibility of having a very big dipole moment. And so this, this is not uh, out of the range of possibility. And then finally, the, um, even though these, these states are not all particularly stable, they, they all have instabilities, the, they can be stabilized by the quantum Zeno effect, namely, if you have a state and it's sitting there looking like it wants to go down, wants to decay, if it's swapped out and moved someplace else before it can build up the quantum probability to decay, then it, then it doesn't decay, it's the quantum Zeno effect. Um, so now that we have a formula for excess heat production, the question is, is it stable? And I thought, oh, let's just plug in the numbers and see what happens. So here's the condition for stability or instability, runaway. If the excess power, if the nuclear power that's generated exceeds the power that's dissipated, that's the condition for runaway. So to get an analytic formula that looks like this, and plug in numbers, and it looks like this. And all I can say is this looks to me like it can be consistent with Fleischmann and Fons runaway and with Mizuno's runaway and with other people's runaways. Um, so the mechanism for runaway is really simple. The plasmons make a electric fields which drive the nuclear transitions. The nuclear power goes in the plasmons that make the field strong. And it can run away if, um, 
if the rate at which the energy goes into the plasmons is faster than the rate at which it leaves. Very, very simple. Loss mechanism. Let me talk briefly about loss mechanisms. So we have the, this mechanism for producing excess heat. What if it gets frustrated? What if something breaks? Okay, so we start with the fusion to compact state transition. And now what we'd like to do is we'd like to go up. But suppose for some reason that's broken. Suppose that your coupling isn't strong enough to exchange enough energy to the phonons or plasmons to actually reach the transition you're trying to get to. So this thing's broken. So this is going to uh, decay. Um, I think low-level DD fusion products are possible. Um, it turns out the state in this model so far is, is a triplet P1, but there's dipole transitions to a singlet S. And uh, that's, that could easily be Chersky's um, state. So this could be the, the origin of the um, uh, electron-positron uh, signals they've been seeing. Okay, so now suppose we go up, and we actually make it up, but suppose now we can't make excess heat for one reason or another. Then we've got the possibly efficient decay of these nuclear molecule states. And um, then if, if the nuclear energy can be transferred to the lattice, so we go down until we're stuck, um, if we're stuck and we're not rescued and boosted up by the uh, compact state transition, then we can have decay of the um, nuclear molecule states. And here's the, in principle, we can tell from what the nuclear molecules uh, are seeing. We can figure out roughly where we are uh, up and down the nuclear molecule chain. Uh, in addition, if we know how much energy and how much how many um, transmutation products are seen, we can connect that back to the model. So at the moment, it's going to be critical in transmutation missions to quantify exactly how many. If you've got a volcano event, a volcanic event or something, you need to figure out how many transmutation products are there, plus estimating the energy, because that'll um, tell you roughly where you are uh, here, going up and down. Anyway, when the excess heat process gets frustrated, we get uh, quantum mechanically incoherent nuclear decays. And um, the ones that are measured seem to be in good agreement um, with, the, uh, uh, with this model. Conclusions. Um, focused for an awful long time on coherent dynamics, but we were missing reasonably stable nuclear states. Last year in April, the brainstorm was these nuclear molecules could provide reasonably stable coherent states. So now, now we have them, we can implement the, the coherent nuclear dynamics. The construction of Hamilton is a straightforward fact. The dipole coupling, all of this is about as simple as it could get in terms of these models. This is, you know, the, the, when this seemed to look, I thought, oh, we're going to be able to understand this. This, this is simple. Um, anyway. Um, this is years past when I still had hair. <laughs> uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the presentation. Any questions, any comments? Nice presentation. Uh, my question is, okay, let's suppose that we have uh, any GBDs due to nuclear reaction in the lattice. How this energy release is transferred to the lattice? It's uh, okay, uh, my point of view is this one. Does it contribute to all parts of the Hamiltonian, like phonon part, uh, plasmon part, something like that, or for certain, let's say, for phonon part only? How do you think? Um, which, whichever is most excited is going to get most of the energy, if you adjust for the strength of the uh, coupling. And where it goes, it's going to go everywhere where things are vibrating. So mm -hmm. the part that goes into the acoustical modes is going to go according to the strength of the acoustical mode across the whole sample. Mm 
Okay. Uh, uh, for the optical phonon rod, it's going to go where the optical phonon rods mm -hmm. are vibrating. And for the plasmon rod, uh, the hope is that the plasmon pretty much everywhere is going to be going in something yeah. uniform. Okay, thank you. Oh, goodness. Hello. <laughs> um, yeah, this uh, your model is very interesting, of course, but the problem is, I think, uh, to calculate really very precisely the coupling constants between the plasmons, phonons, and uh, excited uh, nuclear states. It needs, of course, to, to look at the details the, on, on, of the model. My point is here very small. In the case of uh, um, DD and helium-4, uh, you have a symmetry to neutrons, and then E1 transition is not possible because of um, time inverse symmetry and the term balance. So this kind of matrix elements are not allowed. So only E2 is probably of higher multiple multi polarities can be possible. Okay? So let me respond to both of those issues. The first issue is that people measure how much um, how much radiation is E2, how much is E1, how much is M1, directly from DD fusion experiments where the gamma is seen, so they'll do angular uh, measurements. Yeah, so and, and, the, and there are quite a few papers there. And I've given a table from one <coughs> paper and a plot from another paper. And so from the triplet P1, due to the spin orbit coupling, there's a finite dipole. Um, matrix element up to the triplet P1 state. This is well known in the literature. Mm -hmm. is, uh, E1 is uh, not allowed because of the two neutrons in the initial channel. So in, in, in the case of the, the tail balance, uh, which is um, just uh, responsible for time inverse symmetry, you have the same, you know, two neutrons, the same particles in the exit channel as well. So in this case, you have not allowed it, it, one transition. If there were no spin orbit coupling, it would be spot on. The generalized uh, poly principle would restrict it, make it completely forbidden. But because the, the effective chiral field theory, of course, has spin orbit trans, uh, interaction, and because it's really substantial, you end up with a very healthy, in fact, looking at the plot here, the, um, the E1 is, is stronger than the, the M2. Um, yeah, this is exactly, this <laughs> usually the, the case, but in the case of the D, it's not possible. Of course, there is some small component because of breaking of the symmetry. This is possible. Oh, yeah, yeah, we, we can talk, so talk about this okay. uh, uh, afterwards, but it's clear spin orbit, um, you know, allow, uh, allows there to be E1 coupling. To try to respond to your other question, the minor headache is that of all these nuclear molecule states, um, they're very tough to calculate with precision, and there's no nobody's got a calculation where you can calculate a dipole moment uh, to them these days. The, the, the so, is, I think, to calculate, you know, this possibility of these kinds of uh, transitions compared to the known transitions, how probably they are this mechanism compared to other mechanisms which are known. And uh, then we can speak of this something what is, uh, can be realized or not. You know, there is a problem. Well, I, I, you know, I'm all for uh, getting some horsepower behind getting nuclear models to calculate this kind of thing. But shell model calculations with like 10 to the 11th configurations are needed to get your energy, excited state energy is roughly right. Uh, I'm not aware of any of those being applied to calculating um, specific dipole uh, strengths, but you can get the E1, you know, uh, giant strength. But anyway, okay, we can discuss later. Okay. Yeah. One thing I want to ask: you just, yeah, your your uh, DD state is already a very uh, let's see. Uh, not molecular like to the to the compact state first step, right? And then this this energy transfer to the 
uh, Palladium, for example, Palladium, high excitation state. But why the, the system can select only molecular state because of because the uh, density of and the level density of a normal state is much, much bigger than the particular molecular state levels. I, I'm not sure I understood your question. I can <clears throat> yeah. hold that at any Level density of a normal state is very big. Oh, but the normal states are all unstable. No coherent process is going to proceed with yeah, the stable states. But, but the why the, this DD should go to this that kind of a coherent state? There's a lot of background state. They even if it, if you transfer to that. No, state. I, I, I okay. I understand your question. Yeah. Um, I it's perfectly possible. I did this. I did studies many many years ago on this, where I had um, reasonably stable states and unstable states and allowed all transitions between everybody, let God roll the dice and just see what happens. And the uh, coherent states completely, absolutely dominate the uh, dynamics if they're uh, sufficiently stable. That it's a little bit like impedance matching if you've got voltage and you've got um, a resistor. If your resistance is uh, tera-ohm, you think, aha, the loss is very fast, but if you try to you know, make heat drag it through a tear on resistor, it just won't go. The equations are sort of the same for coherent dynamics going to um, states that are stable versus states that are very unstable. But very unstable ones, you just cannot get any population there to stay. It just doesn't participate in uh, coherent dynamics. <laughs> okay, thank you very much.